And she's a friend of mine I used to work with, but she's been a stay-at-home mom for the last 15 years. How many people think a, a person who's been not in the software market for 15 years is going to be able to get a job very easily today? Nobody raises their hand. I think that's the right answer. So I was talking to her, and, and she said, you know, I really want thinking about going back to work. Sorry about that. It's, just, it's, it's not that so much that it powered off as much that, as it is that I need your password. <laughs> Write it on this piece of paper. And, and so I, I said, why don't you come write some software for my project? And she said, oh, because then you'd have something on your resume that says, I'm not totally obsolete, right? And so she, she did that. And she hasn't decided to go back to work yet. She's still really kind of ambiguous about whether, ambivalent whether she wants to do that or not. But it's the kind of thing she can do to get things on her resume that, that, that will enable her to find a job without coming in as a you know, first level, low level type person, right, that, that she's actually contributed to non-trivial um, projects and software. I'll try and just talk, I'll just try and touch the button more often. And I'm, all, I'm getting, you're going to run me out of time in here pretty soon anyway. Um, you got at least a half hour to go. I think I have, uh, oh, to the next thing. I think I'm supposed to be out of here officially at, Oh, is it till Ted after? Well, I, I, so this talk is, so the good news for you guys is hey, this talk is not going to go over time. This is not a long talk. Um, now, I wish I could just save that time for my other talk because my other talk will go over time if I let it. Um, so, okay, now I have to remember how to, so this is my career. I talked about that, right? I talked about the other stuff. So. So why from the perspective of the world? Why would you want to do this? Because you can improve computing for everyone. You contribute to the world in a way that other people benefit from. It is humbling and awesome. To me, it's somebody who says, so I had a guy who emailed me, true story, and said, you know, I've never really emailed you on the mailing list before, but I wanted to tell you I've done my 100th install of the Linux HA package. And I said, wow, that's impressive. You, you know, that, that kind of stuff, you realize that what you've done actually matters. It matters to somebody. Now, uh, it helps my, my career, and you know, I do a lot of things to keep my life going, but it helped his life. And there are thousands, probably 100,000 systems over the world that have installed this stuff. And it's like, it's used in places like the German FAA for tower operations and all kinds of places, right? People use this stuff. And, and it's just, it, it has improved, I'm not so much bragging about what I did, but I'm saying what you can do when you do it is that your contributions can have the same kinds of effects. Sharing and collaboration raises the bar for everyone. And not only is it improved dollar work, but it maybe improves dollar work in, where in is in, in plus one, right? Improves where you're going. Improves the, one of the interesting things, if you contribute to an area, then find it some, you know, when you want to find the next job, find somebody to whom that's really important. Go there. They will really like having you around. Um, and it makes projects viable. People who use open source projects make them viable. A project which has no users is not viable. A project which has no contributors isn't very viable. So you contribute to the livelihood and the lifeblood of these projects by doing this. And in turn, you've received so much. You have received, how many people think they've received a lot through open source, the use of open source software in their lives? And think how much you've received. This allows you the chance to give back. Give back to the people who've given to you, with, you know, without having any idea who you are. Right? To give as you've received. So I talked, to, so I, I forgot about that slide. Well, I said I knew what the next slide was. Well, I forgot about that one. So anyway, go on. Relevant to work. So the other things you want to look at is you, would look, you want to look for a project that has an open community. Some places are open source in the sense of we write the software and we throw it over the wall and, and it has the li GPL license on it and have a nice day. There is a company that who's, who, who's, um, whose symbol used, used, uh, is, is uh, hats. And they, you know, you might know the one I mean. And they used to be very much guilty of that. Not so much anymore, to some degree they still are, but they used to be very guilty of, yeah, it's open source, but we don't let anybody contribute to it that doesn't, it doesn't get a paycheck from us. Um, 
So whatever the project is, regardless of who uh, contributes to it, and I wouldn't say that that company today is that way on all their projects, but you see some of it still. Uh, you want to look for an open community. And the open source is not the same as open community. Open community means people, they welcome people to come contribute. You want to look for one that's viable or active, cool, that you get off on. You say, oh, this is so awesome. Which, for example, my assimilation project is awesome. And, and, and friendly to newbies. A lot of places are really friendly to newbies and some are not. Some are not. And you want to look at any or all of cool and exciting and important. You know, if you can get all of these things at once, man, you're, you're, go you're golden. But these are the things you want to look for. These are the ones you think, want to think about. So the question is, what do you want to do to contribute to them? Well, contribute documentation. Anybody think that they know of an open source project which has too much documentation? <laughs> Anybody think that they have too high a quality documentation? So, um, so that's, that's a place to start because the thing is, I told you that with the guy who wrote the documentation for Linux HA, I was so, I cannot tell you how grateful I was for the work he did. Yes, hello. So, let me tell you how that worked, by the way. So we had a mailing list, and I had written some like really kind of half, half baked. That's where that's politer, more polite, half baked documentation. And 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 he said I take it over. So he took it over, you know, started with it, and he wrote better stuff. And every time somebody asked a question on the mailing list, I would answer it, and I'd tell him, "Could you put this in the documentation?" And he did. And you could measure the results. The number of questions went down and down and down and down, and when and, and all of a sudden, the documentation worked. Because, see, documentation needs to work. It doesn't need to be pretty. It doesn't need to be elegant. It needs to work. It needs to func perform its function, which is to say, keep people from bugging the maintainers about questions. And that's how you can tell it works. And his documentation worked. And this is, so I would just answer the question, which I was going to do anyway on the mailing list, and I would CC him and say, uh, could you put this in the document? Could you fold this in the documentation? And he would find out a place to put in the documentation. And then nobody would ask that question again because they would read the documentation. And it had questions, answers to questions that people actually asked. You know, that's, the, that's how you could tell what it needed to be in it was because of the questions people asked. And you can answer questions on the mailing list, even if the document you don't want to update documentation. Somebody asks a question, say, oh, you do that by doing blah, 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 blah. Maybe you want to update the documentation, or maybe it says that already, and you can point them at it politely and nicely. Because I think I'm not a fan of, um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of reading the manual, but I'm not a fan of telling people, um, giving them e-finger while I, while I uh, how many people think they've gotten e-finger from, from the system sometime? Yeah, I've gotten it, me too. Everybody gets e-finger from the system sometimes. That's one of the error nodes. It's, I'm sure it's in the pound defined somewhere. Um, and g do great bug reports. Do, write great bug reports. There's nothing, it's, it's like, I had a bug, for example, that went on for years, and it went like this. Every time, every time you move an IP address from here to there, it takes five minutes for it to show up. And I said, what kind of routers do you have? I don't know. Um, I said, you know, what brand are they? Well, I'm not sure. I don't do networking. And so I just knew that out there somewhere, there were some people occasionally who had trouble with IP addresses moving over and taking a long time to show up, even though I know that we moved them over in seconds. And everybody else saw this behavior. One day I got some uh, Japanese guys, and I'm going to be a little, I'll, I'll tell you how I hear it in my head when I heard them. Oh, Mr. Robertson, we are so sorry to tell you that we find this bug in your software. And we are so sorry to tell you that this RFC here and here and here describes how you should be doing it. We're so sorry to give you this patch that fixes it. And we apologize for intruding on your life and telling you these things. And my reaction was, I'm going to put that patch in so fast it will make your head spin. <laughs> and one of the Europeans had not heard that thing. He says, oh, I like that, making your head spin, right? <laughs> and one of the cool things that happens about internationally too is, is w one day, 
I, uh, a guy had a problem and I put out a patch and I, I put it and I was exhausted and I put it, to, put it in the system and I went to bed and went to sleep and got up late the next day and I had an email from the guy apologizing that it had taken so long to test it because he was in Europe. It had taken him all day to get into the, the, the bug, to fix the, to put the patch in that I gave him. He says, no problem, I was asleep then, man. Um, sometimes time zones are your friends. Most of the time not, but sometimes they are. And um, so write great bug reports. That was a great bug report. It tells me not only what was wrong, how to fix it, what the RFC was to reference to tell me why what I was doing wasn't adequate, right? It's like, oh my goodness, I've never gotten a bug report I love more than that, ever. And make suggestions. You know, this is really cool, but wouldn't it be even cooler if we did that? So, oh, I never thought about that. I never. Oh, that's a really cool idea. Why don't we do that? And sometimes it's really simple to do. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes, it, like when I went to a Atlanta Linux users group and I said, yeah, I get this problem with deciding uh, people not knowing how to set their timeouts for uh, dead time, you know, uh, how, how late they should set, uh, when you send heartbeats, how, how long I should wait before declaring a machine dead uh, since the last heartbeat I heard. I have no idea how to do that. And people would say, uh, I don't, and I, I didn't have any idea do it. And the guy just suggests, why don't you have a warning time that you set maybe twice as high as they want for dead time and set the real dead time high and then you can figure out how, what the worst case you get on a warning and, and then you can set the dead time twice as high as that. And I said, oh, that's obvious. And it took me, I don't know, two hours to put in the code. So when I can't, got home, I, put, I don't think I did it that night at the hotel. But I did it the, with either the night at the hotel or the next night when I was home. Um, you, can, you can become a reference site. If you will agree to let them say, I, we use this stuff and we love it, there's, that, there is nothing, you know, all you have to do is use it and say, yeah, we use it. Be willing to say that. Be willing to be the person who stands up and says, yeah, these people use it and it's great. That helps people get trust in it. How many people think that you ought to just trust any old open source project you run across? No, me neither, by the way. Um, I don't either. How do you decide to trust it? Well, you look at the mailing list. You look at the, the, you look at the work that people have done in the past, perhaps. You look at other people's comments on it. You maybe watch them, listen to talks like I'm going to give, all this kind of stuff. But the thing you really look for more than anything else is uh, what other people are using it. So if you're going to be brave and use it, you should be willing to pay back at least by saying, yeah, we use it. I'm willing to say that. Get your boss to say that. Another thing, of course, is you can, you can do promotion or give talks on it. You can promote it and give talks on it. Lots of, how many people have uh, Linux users groups or, or, or meetups or something like that in your area that you go to? So if there's a project you use, how many people think those people are al always have all the speakers they ever need for those things? Nobody. So show up. If that's what's in front of you to do, show up and do it. And the thing is, when you stand up here, that's how people mistake you for an expert. It's, it's, it's because you're standing behind this and it's like, oh, he must be really, really smart. He, no, he's just really dumb. He doesn't know not to do this. <laughs> and and um, you can give talks or promote it in other ways. Uh, you know, you can, that might be uh, whatever you're saying, if you're a social media person, might be doing it on social media, whatever, right? Uh, you can blog or write books on it. As, as I mentioned here, some of the other people do uh, have, have written books on these subjects. And once you become mistaken for an expert, people start asking you to do things like write books on this stuff. It really does happen. I've had it asked. Uh, people want me to write about my last project, not about my current one. And I'm actually too busy with my current one at the moment anyway. Um, so what, so now, now the question is, what else can you do? You can do build, packaging, continuous integration, write tests or do testing. You can fix bugs. You can write or attach your, your patch to the, to, the, to the complaint. That's the best. You can write plugins a lot. So the common thing to do that's easy to do, that, there's usually a lot of projects have a plugin thing that you do. Maybe it's a monitoring thing or maybe it's a discovery thing like in my case, whatever it is. Often the plugin requires the least understanding of the system. And uh, uh, my experience was the most contributions I got from average system administrators tended to be plugins. So write a plugin. Write code in the main part. Dive in and learn something uh, deeper. 
you know, get in where you understand it, because it's usually pretty cool stuff. Um, give encouragement. Say thanks. And how many people have said thanks to, the, to somebody on a mailing list for their help or for the project for the software? Do it. Just do it. Because otherwise, it is literally a thankless job. And I don't, although that sounds like a pun, and, I, and it is, and it's sort of intentional. The, the, the truth is, it is, if people don't come back and say, I used it, thank you. What you will otherwise get is, I used it and I had a problem. Now, yeah, and be nice. Be nice. Um, I don't like when people are not nice on my mailing list, including me. Occasionally I fail. And uh, I apologize. And if I don't, send me a private email and remind me that I haven't apologized. Because that's my goal, is to, is to create a nice place to work. I, want, I, I don't want to work in a sewer. You know, I want to work in a nice place. And if I'm making it not a nice place, you need to tell me. You just made a mess. Clean that up. I like having a dog in the house that's not trained. You know, purchase developer support. If your organization is capable or able to purchase developer support, you know, from the people who do the work, not from somebody else who resells it, then do it. Because those are the people who are actually doing the work, not the people who are redistributing the software. Now, of course, those people deserve support for other reasons, right? But think about providing support to the people who actually provide the packages that you really rely upon. And of course, the last step is, after having explained what to do, why to do it, what to do, now the next step is do it. And to do it, you choose a project. I suggest the assimilation project. It is by far the coolest project on the planet. And if you don't believe me, just ask me. <laughs> but it's not important that you choose mine. But do choose a project. Now, tomorrow, uh, this is the point where I give my totally shameless plug. Uh, I give a talk on the assimilation project tomorrow. And as, I've, as, as has been witnessed here in this room, you've already heard it in this very room, it is the coolest project on the planet. You, you heard it, right? It's, it's, a, it's a system management tool that helps you understand uh, what your systems are doing and then does things about it. Like, for example, if I know you have uh, running MySQL on this machine, we just monitor it for you. If I, I look at what you have here and I say, you know, this is not in compliance with security best practices, we tell you. Because we know more about your systems than you do. And we keep it up to date all the time. There's a lot of interesting things that go with that. We'll talk about that tomorrow. I don't want to talk about it anymore today. But I, but I, but I, uh, I, I, I got permission to give my shameless plug here, so I gave it. Um, but the thing is, show up, do something. This, is, this, is, this would have been lots better with the choose a project, and then the last, you know, it would have all gone through in a very nicely pretty. But you, know, you don't get to do that with PDFs and if you can't get your laptop to behave. Obviously, I have to figure that out before tomorrow because, um, because tomorrow's slides are uh, a little different. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for your time. And if you have questions, uh, what, what, do people have questions about this? We have 10 yeah. minutes for questions. Sure. Um, so my question uh, goes to choosing a project to yes. plug into. Um, I'm thinking of Ubuntu in particular, but there's a bunch of projects where it seems like there's a lot of noise around, hey, we need help, hey, we need help, hey, we need help. You ask, hey, what do you need help with? Well, I don't know. So uh, what threshold or what size of a project would you aim at? I, I, I don't think the size of the project is important. I think the important thing is, so one of the things I discovered was, one of the things that ha happened in my project, Linux HA project, I said, nobody's contributing anything. And I thought, oh, maybe that's because I didn't tell them what the, I, I need doing. So I made a to-do list, right? Um, and I think people have to be able to answer that question. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing, let me tell you how I answer that question when someone asks me. I go through the process and say, what do you like doing? What are your skills? You know, um, Think about what you like doing. If, if, if you're going to contribute to a project in an era, doing something you don't like, it's not going to work. <laughs> you either want to learn it, or you think it would be fun to do it, and maybe you try it for a while and discover it wasn't so much fun as you thought. That's okay, too. You know, people apologize to me for not doing what they committed to do. I wish I could tell you that was no, abnormal, but it's not. What's normal is that people my mom used to say, you're about, when I was a kid and eating, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. A lot of people's eyes are bigger than their stomach, and that's the truth. 
but you know, show up, find something to do, and do it. Uh, I, it depends on what you want to do. For example, I asked the guy, what are your skills? He said, I'm a sysadmin. I said, oh, continuous integration is kind of a sysadmin-like skill. You write scripts, you get stuff together, you watch it work. And I said, why don't you look at that, right? So the thing is, if they can't answer that question, you might want to find another project. And you might say, look, if you could suggest something, and here are my skills, uh, then I would do it. But if you can't suggest something, you know, I don't know what I can do, right? If the project can't answer that question, then they don't know where they're going, right? I can answer that question. You tell me what your skills are, and I will find a place for you uh, on my project. Other pe I'm, not, I'm not doing, other projects can do the same. I wasn't trying to say that. My shameless plug is actually over, uh, mostly. <laughs> um, but that's what you do. You, ask the, you present your skills, what you're interested in doing, the things that sound like fun to you. Do you have anything that would be, make use of those skills? And, and sometimes show up and one of the things I've discovered in my career is if you're willing to show up and do what no one else wants, wants, wants to do, you'll have a job for life. And that's how come I did system administration, by the way, for 10 years. Because nobody else really wants to do that. You know, it's like, and I was willing to do it and I like doing it. And so anyway, next question. I think you're telling the wrong group that, Alan. <laughs> no, but it's really true. It's really true that, 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 you know, a lot of what you do, nobody else wants to do. And that's one of the reasons why they're actually in demand. Somebody who will show up and do the work, right? Next question. You, sir, back in the back. Do you have a suggested time frame where, you know, where you should do a project where, you know, for the length of, you know, for the individual, if they were beginning versus, you know, you know, beginning to start out like a three month or a six month or something like that? So I would start with something really small. I mean, I would start with something you can do in a day. Because do you have like a real job, a day job? <laughs> I mean, most people in here do. And I have a, you have a life and you have kids, you have grandkids, whatever. I have grandkids, different people in different situations. And the truth is, this will never be as important as life. This will never be as important as your wife or your husband or your kids or whatever, right? And, and you can't, although I said it can help your career, it won't help your career if you do this at the exclusion of your real job. So think about what's going to fit into your life the way it is, right? That you can squeeze out the time to do, that you can get permission for your wife, or whatever your situation is, to do this and squeeze it out. Because if you can't, you're going to be the person whose eyes are bigger than your stomach and not be able to do it. I started with something small. And, and you know, like, uh, file a good bug report, right? Uh, uh, correct spelling in a documentation. Correct punctuation in a documentation. Whatever it, I don't know if you've not, you know, whatever it is that occurs to you. Um, show up and do something. People notice that too. Now if you come in and say, you're obviously an idiot because you can't spell, that's not going to get you anywhere. So if I'm say, I just noticed this and thought you might want to have it corrected. And if you correct it from British spelling to American spelling, it's probably not going to go over well either. <laughs> so, but you, you get the idea, right? Find something small to do to start with because then you'll get known as the, the guy who shows up and does stuff. Right? As opposed to, I'll help you a lot, I'll give you a lot of training and stuff, and then you won't do it because you don't have the time. You've bitten off more than you can chew. If you show up and do stuff, then people say, oh, I know you, I'll help you. It's like any, it's, this, it's like, it, it has a remarkable resemblance to life itself. <laughs> yes, you, you, sir. Yeah, I think there's a, a responsibility side on the actual open source project. Absolutely. There are certain vendors that have done a fantastic job. Um, Chef, for one, I work for Docker. Docker has done a fantastic job. When you go in and you see, they tell you exactly how to commit. They actually give you pools of things that they're looking at fix. I would recommend to anybody managing an open source project to be very diligent about opening that up. So I think most people have a hard time. They, they're just too afraid to go in and, and do anything where, you know, where it, it just they don't know the model. They don't know the expertise. And that's true. And one of the things, the point, something I'll mention here that goes with what you, 
exactly what you said here is that every project is different. And if you try and apply one project expectation to another one, it may or may not work for you, and you may get corrected politely, and you may get not corrected politely. I, I prefer projects that collect, correct you politely, but that may not happen to you. Um, open source projects are not all well known for their social skills. <laughs> and those that are often become hackers. We call that social engineering, right? Um, not, another question. So now, just now the thing is, before you leave here, you have to think about what project you're going to contribute to. And if you don't have one in mind, show up at mine, and, and he will harangue me until I get you on, uh, something good to do on my project. I love your project. You do need to add those easy uh, to get started um, opportunities. Yeah, so I have a few. Uh, uh, Right. One of the things that hurts, hurts us at the moment was I just switched source control systems. And so all the documentation on how to get started is wrong. Um, but I mean, it happened like two weeks ago. So, it's, so there's a documentation opportunity. Um, so uh, any other questions? All right. With that, I'll let you guys go. And thanks very much for your time. We're going to have the uh, happy hour in about five minutes in E160 with the Vendor, Vendor Expo. Uh, we have uh, Birds of Feather sessions coming on tonight between 6 and 8. Don't quote me on that. There's stuff uh, on the wall on the opposite side of that wall. And uh, Alan's going to be at the keynote dinner tonight. If anyone else wants to uh, continue the conversation or maybe contribute back, uh, so, can do so at the keynote dinner. We're selling tickets at registration. And I have stickers for those of you who like stickers. The stickers look roughly like the back of my shirt. So it says, uh, resistance is futile and has a resistor on it. <laughs>